Not every indie game needs to be on the Nintendo Switch. As controversial a statement as this may sound, developers may be better off avoiding the popular platform if it is simply not possible to get the game running on it. And if they absolutely must release a broken Switch port, please at least don't charge a premium price for such a clearly inferior product. Developed by 3D Cloud, Xenon Racer isn't technically an indie game because it's published by Dutch company Sadesco. However, it's an indie in spirit and certainly not one worthy of a $50 price tag. Yes, that's right, the game you are looking at on screen now retails for $50 on Nintendo Switch. It's the same price on PS4 and Xbox One, but $40 on PC. Those versions look a lot better than this one, so I want to emphasize that this review is for the Nintendo Switch version only, as is the score of one star out of five. I'd be a lot more generous if I got to play the game that is currently advertised on the eShop with this trailer. YouTube compression means visual downgrades aren't always as clear as I'd like, but I'd wager you can spot the difference between the trailer and the release version here. One, but not all, of the trailers at least includes a brief disclaimer at the start about it not being in-game footage, but the trailer does its best to make you think it is, even going as far as including a mock-up of it being played split-screen on the Switch. This is blatant false advertisement, and I hope the developers and or Nintendo replace it with footage that represents the $50 game you're actually buying. Anyway, that game is Xenon Racer, an arcade racer with a focus on drifting around corners and maintaining speed at all times. It's a throwback to the early days of 3D racing games like the Ridge Racer series, which ignored the trendy accuracy of racing sims like Gran Turismo and most Codemasters games of the era. You drift around corners, turning unrealistically on a pin, and the only notable items are speed boosts, which you earn either by running over pads on the track or by drifting. Even though you race against seven opponents, much of the time it feels like you versus the track as you try to perfect drifts and use your speed boost at exactly the right time. At its heart, Xenon Racer is simple, and I certainly don't mean that as a criticism. I've enjoyed games like this a lot over the years, and still get a kick out of throwing my car around corners without worrying about technical stuff like suspension and weight shifting, while also not looking out for blue shells. What's more, arcade racers should be an excellent fit for handheld devices and short pick up and play sessions. I've spent a fair few hours with Fast RMX for example, and I love that I can boot it up and knock out a tournament in less than 15 minutes. The big difference between Xenon Racer and the likes of Fast RMX and Red Out is that those games didn't make me feel nauseous when I played. Fast arcade racers like Xenon Racer need to run at high and consistent frame rates. Ideally this would be at least a locked 60 frames per second. Any severe drops from there are a problem due to the pace of the game and the quick reaction times required. In some cases lowering the frame rate to a locked 30 frames per second might be preferable because at least then it is consistent. Well, Xenon Racer doesn't even reach the giddy highs of 30 frames per second. It spends the entire time wavering between the low to mid 20s, and while it's not unplayable, it is an incredibly uncomfortable experience. I sampled 15 random sections of my video footage to frame count, and the highest it ever hit was 27 frames per second. 25 frames per second was the modal value, and 23 the lowest. To make matters worse, there is also considerable input delay, so regardless of which of the three options you use to drift, being a tap of the brakes or the handbrake or letting go of the accelerator briefly, there is always a delay before the drift actually starts. I don't think this is deliberate because you can feel a similar amount of lag with regular turning, although the cars are so slow and heavy that it's difficult to say exactly what level of responsiveness is intended and what is lag. If it's not input or lag, well it certainly feels like it. And then there's the atrocious amount of pop-in and the limited draw distance that not only affects the background but also the walls and arrows that are supposed to guide you around the track. I did my best to memorise tracks, but with such a limited draw distance and so much pop-in, it's tricky to recognise the relevant markers in time. Draw distance is even worse in handheld mode where the whole thing becomes a blurry mess. There's also next to no lighting effects, and when there is it looks like lightning is bouncing off the ground. Pools of water pop in at the last second and there's no visible signs of cars interacting with them. To be honest though, those are minor problems in the grand scheme of things. The variable frame rate, poor quality visuals and all the pop-in meant I couldn't play for more than half an hour without feeling nauseous and needing to take a break. The developer has assured me that a patch is coming in April, but I'm not convinced a patch is going to fix all these issues. At the very least we need a locked 30 frames per second, reduction in input lag or more responsiveness, less pop-in and a better draw distance. 
it's going to have to be one hell of a patch. Xenon Racer is designed to be challenging, I'm sure even running smoothly it's not an easy game to beat. On Switch it feels nigh on impossible and I'm not sure how much of that is the game versus the performance. I ended up turning the difficulty down to easy and still couldn't beat the main campaign which is a lengthy tournament called Xenon Racing Championship. The setup for this tournament is that in the year 2030 we live in the time of flying cars, except we're not racing flying cars. Apparently this is a one-off tournament using high powered electricity and xenon gas vehicles with the goal being to get people used to racing flying cars. I'm not sure how racing on wheels gets anyone used to racing flying cars. My driver's license doesn't qualify me to pilot planes. It doesn't matter obviously, like, arcade races don't need a story or premise, I just thought it was odd. I'm not sure why the description mentions flying cars at all, like just say it's a futuristic racer and leave it at that. I don't usually claim to be especially good at any type of game, but it would be a bit disingenuous to say that I'm terrible at arcade racers. I've been playing games like this for over 25 years in some form or another. I'm halfway decent. You might not think that from the footage though, and bear in mind I've probably been selective in what I've shown. The easiest way to get your criticism dismissed is by not being considered good enough at the game. In the world of YouTube reviews, if you show footage of yourself missing a shot, getting spotted, or in this case misjudging a corner, expect to see a bunch of people saying you suck and that your opinion shouldn't be taken seriously. That's why usually reviewers don't show all their bad moments. I don't have much choice here. Xenon Racer is insanely hard on Switch, mainly because you can't see what's coming and the frame rate can make you ill. Difficulty seems to be a common complaint across the platforms though, and the developers have said they are adjusting the AI, so expect this to get changed. However, the Switch version is going to need extra attention given that you aren't just racing against opponents, but against the poor performance of the game itself. Even if you ignore performance issues, there are still underlying niggles that I recommend you research further if you're considering picking this up on another platform. The handling feels incredibly stiff to me, regardless of how many changes I made to the vehicle, and that is presumably consistent across platforms, although it's possible the poor frame rate exasperates the issues on Switch. The damage system also feels a little unfair, especially on the medium and hard difficulties where even small knocks take off huge chunks of the car's health. Crashing has its own built-in punishment, namely you slow down, so I'm not sure why this is even necessary. If your car gets destroyed, you get put further back on the track and lose a bunch of time. I lost at least four places per crash, it's a strict punishment. On medium difficulty, if you crash, you almost certainly won't win the race, and many races require you to come in first to proceed. There's little chance of you catching up because the AI doesn't take damage. As far as I can tell, they never crash unless you knock into them, and they don't have a health bar. There's also a fair bit of rubber banding, and while this doesn't have to be a huge problem, it does seem to help your opponents more than you. It was common for me to completely lose touch with first place and never catch up, no matter how well I raced, whereas my opponents would come out of nowhere to overtake me after the slightest error. And that's on easy difficulty. Xenon Racer does have a few things going for it. One of its best features is the lengthy load screens, which last for just under a minute and kick in even if you only want to restart a race. And yes, the long load screens are a positive, because they give you time to take a sip of water and walk around a bit to reduce the nausea before the next bout of inconsistent 25 frames per second action. More genuinely, there's technically a lot of tracks with I believe 20 in total and double that if you include the mirrored versions. That said, there are only 7 regions, so many of the tracks look much the same, especially given the low quality visuals. At a glance I wouldn't be able to distinguish between the Boston Port and Boston Downtown tracks for example. You can opt to race all the tracks at night, although given the poor quality lighting and already limited draw distance, I wouldn't recommend it. Unfortunately, there aren't any weather conditions beyond sunny and cloudy, so the track condition is always the same. There are a lot of cars and car customization options, both for cosmetics and performance. You can tweak all the colours and change up major parts like wheels, rims and windows. You can even change how your turbo boost works, so it can recharge faster but last for less time and vice versa. I appreciated the flexibility offered by all the upgrades, but I only noticed differences in the extremes, so making little tweaks here and there didn't hold much value for me. Again, this might come down to me playing on the Switch version. If the game had been faster and more responsive, I might have noticed differences to speed and handling, but as it stands, I didn't. Credit should also be given to the inclusion of a two-player split-screen mode, which surprisingly doesn't seem to affect the performance at all. I expected it to be borderline unplayable, but was pleasantly surprised. I can't comment on the online mode because there were never any races to join. That's no one's fault as such, it's just worth noting. I can't comment on the other versions, but I definitely don't recommend the Switch version of Xenon Racer. The problems I've listed may seem superficial, but these graphical glitches all combine to make the game uncomfortable to play throughout. The draw distance and pop-in means you can't spot corners until late, the poor frame rate means that you can't respond promptly once they have popped in, and even if you do respond promptly, you have to contend with the input lag and stiff movement. 
I know a one star score seems harsh. On three occasions while writing this script I went back to play more Xenon Racer to see if maybe I was being unfair. However every time I did I had to stop playing after no more than half an hour at the absolute most and that includes around 5 minutes of load screens. Maybe there's a fun game in here somewhere however Xenon Racer is simply not ready for release on Switch and certainly shouldn't be $50. Fast RMX is available for $20, buy that instead. It looks a hell of a lot better both in docked and handheld and runs at 60 frames per second. Plus it doesn't make me feel ill. Ok thank you for watching, please like, share and subscribe if you enjoyed the video and let me know what you thought in the comments. I'd particularly like to hear from anyone who has played the other versions and can let me know how they run. I have a Patreon if you'd like to support the channel financially. You can get your name in the credits and a Patreon role in my Discord server for a dollar a month. More indie reviews are coming in the next few weeks along with a critique of Metro Exodus sometime in April. I may also get round to reviews of Devil May Cry 5, The Division 2 and Sekiro, time depending. Ok until next time, cheers.